Side Hustle Show 306, how to start a business you care about. Imagine going from having no business ideas and no money to making your first sales in two weeks. That's the transformation my guest today specializes in. How he does it, coming right up. What's up, what's up, Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because why is 90% of how. That's a quote I heard recently from Tim Ferriss and how I interpret that is in entrepreneurship, you've got to supply your own motivation. Why do you want to do this? That why is what gets you through the hard times. And remember, if it were easy, everybody will be doing it. So today, I'm excited to introduce Alan Donegan from popupbusinessschool.co.uk. Alan specializes in getting new entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs off the sidelines and into the game, usually for free. How he does this is through in-person workshops that are free to attend, and he was gracious enough to sit down and share some of his methodology from those workshops with me in today's episode. Now, why is he so adamant about bootstrapping and not taking on a load of debt to start your business? Well, he had to watch his family go through a multi-million dollar bankruptcy and doesn't want anybody else to have to experience that same fate. Stick around in this episode to hear how Alan pulls business ideas out of people who've never had them before, how he has his students quickly and cheaply validate those ideas, and what makes for a successful pitch. My goal for this episode, to help you come up with two to three business ideas you can start this weekend. Notes and links from this episode, plus a free downloadable PDF highlight reel summary with all of Alan's top tips from the call are at sidehustlenation.com slash Alan. That's A-L-A-N. You're about to hear how to get paid for your unique interests, skills, and knowledge. And when I need to get paid, I rely on our sponsor, FreshBooks.com, to help me send professional-looking invoices to clients or advertisers. Inside FreshBooks, you'll find invoicing, expense management, proposals, time tracking, and more. All in one place, so you can spend less time on admin and paperwork, and more time growing your business and serving your customers. Visit freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30 day completely free trial today with no credit card required. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle and enter the side hustle show in the how did you hear about us section. This edition of the side hustle show is also brought to you by designcrowd.com. When I was working on the cover design for buy buttons, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted, but I was looking for some professional help to help me bring it to life. On Design Crowd, I had a dozen designers from all around the world submitting their ideas and competing for my business. It was a pretty cool process, and they do much more than just book covers, pretty much any graphic design project you need done. Side Hustle Show listeners can get up to $100 off your next design project at designcrowd.com slash hustle. That's designcrowd.com slash hustle, or use promo code hustle at checkout for that special Side Hustle Show offer. I'll be back with my top takeaways from this chat with Alan after the interview. Ready? Let's do it. Some of the people out there are searching for the killer idea, the great idea, the unique idea. And there's so much pressure from traditional business advice to find your USP, your unique selling point. How is your business unique? How are you special? And that helps. But I tell you what, you don't need a game-changing idea you just need an idea and you need to get on with it. Well, to give an example of an idea that is not a game-changing idea, we had a lady called Sharice come along to the pop-up business school in Kent. She was lovely. The question we always ask is, what excites you? Because you could build any business you like. Why not build one that you actually enjoy running? So we ask, what excites you? Because it's a little bit easier to answer than what's your true passion or those questions are very difficult to answer. But if you ask someone what excites you, what gets you going, what gets you out of bed in the mornings, it's easier to answer. So we asked Sharice what excites you. She looked a bit, a little bit sheepish. And then she said, I get quite excited by cleaning and seeing the kitchen clean after I've finished. And the first thought that went through my head was, I know plenty of people who aren't excited by cleaning. There's probably a business in that. So she set up a cleaning business. Now, is cleaning game-changing? Is cleaning unique? Is cleaning different? 
The cleaning services have been around forever, but she enjoys the end results. She enjoys helping people and she makes a great living because she actually enjoys it. She's hired her first member of staff. She's growing a little business. It's incredible what she has achieved. So I think stop searching for the game changing idea and start something. Because the idea you start with probably won't be the one you end up running in five years anyway. You've just got to get in the game. So with the cleaning example, okay, there's a very obvious need and, and an opposite set of people who really dislike cleaning and would be glad to hire it out. What if I'm answering that question? Well, what excites you? Well, I like skiing. I like watching college football. I like reading business books. It's hard to see a direct business on the other side of that. Well, let's take all three of those. Let's start with skiing. There's plenty of people who want to learn to ski. There's plenty of people who want to go on ski tours, but don't know how to do it. There's ski bloggers. There's a million ways to make money out of skiing. The second one was watching college football. Now, that is a competitive market. You're probably not going to go and play college football at the moment. You're a bit old for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm well, well past my prime. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But there's YouTube channels about it. There's bloggers about it. There's podcasters about it. There is every way to get involved with that subject. It's finding that way into it. And even on business books, I've seen businesses that they read business books and then they summarize them and they sell the summaries. And then there's they become a trainer, read all the business books and then train businesses how to use them because they haven't got time to read them themselves. Like in every idea, there is a way to generate income. We just need to know what you're excited about. And then we can drill down from that and test different ways to make money. Any other interesting examples from the groups that come to mind on what at first glance didn't seem like there was a business there? The classic one is when I put online, you can make money doing something you actually enjoy. There's always one person who goes, well, I enjoy sleeping. How are you going to make money out of that? And I didn't really have a good answer for that until recently, until I met a young guy called Kieran from Glasgow who came to one of our workshops and he's built a blog reviewing mattresses. And I can't believe it. He makes a full-time living. He does really well reviewing mattresses and then gets the affiliate commission selling mattresses. So I genuinely don't care what it is that excites you. There is a way to find money doing it. What you've got to do, and like going back to the why, we get two main groups of people who come along. There's the people who are building businesses because they think they can make money doing it. And there's the people who build businesses because it's actually what they enjoy doing. And what we found is in terms of the why, the money wears off after a while. Unless you genuinely love building businesses, then it doesn't really matter what the subject is, just build a business. But for most of us, it's find a business that gets you going because then you actually want to get out of bed and do it in the morning. Yeah, I probably fall into that first category of, you know, my first real business was a footwear comparison shopping site. And I'm not a sneakerhead. I was probably my own worst customer. I probably bought three pairs of shoes over the course of 10 years. I don't really care about the subject matter, but it was the day-to-day -day operations that became exciting, figuring out different optimizations and learning how to advertise smarter and drive traffic and negotiate deals with my advertising partners. Like all of that became very exciting and interesting to me, even if on the surface, the underlying subject was not. So you've fallen in love with the act of running a business and that's what you get to do every day. And if you're doing what you love every day, it's difficult to fail when you really enjoy what you're doing. There is a bit that you've got to be smart to get money out of it. And I've seen so many people who charge out there and they don't ask for payment or they're nervous about asking for payment or they don't bring cash in. But if you really love what you're doing and you work hard at making it work as a business, it's very difficult to fail. And that kind of echoes the, I believe it's Cal Newport in Be So Good They Can't Ignore You. I forget the exact title of the book, but basically echoing that sentiment is like, don't chase your passion, chase something that you're interested in, that you have some skills in perhaps, and you'll often find you become passionate about it down the road. When I started the podcast, of course, had no idea what I was doing, but had a, an interest in it and maybe a desire to keep it going and have become really passionate about it over the years and trying to make good radio and trying to improve week after week. What do you say, like maybe in the cleaning example, well, it's been done before. And on the one hand, I guess that's good because 
there's some validation there, but what about competition? How am I going to stand out? I think it was Richard Branson said, there's always room in the market for the best in the world. Yeah, but when you're just starting out, you're not the best in the world. No, but you can get there and you can work at it. And I'll tell you what, Sharice, I don't know if she's the best cleaner in the world or not, but my timeline on Facebook is filled up with shiny kitchens that she's proud of. And that energy and passion that she just throws into doing what she's doing makes her stand out. And it's actually like, if you care about what you're doing and you're working to do a good job for people, it's surprising how far that goes. And I'm actually shocked that in today's world, it doesn't take a lot more than genuinely caring about your customers to make you stand out from quite a lot of businesses out there. Yeah, that was Chris Schwab from ThinkMaids and you know, similar cleaning business, except he was not the one doing the cleaning. But he was like, I'm going to be the best phone representative. I'm going to be super responsive to customer inquiries and kind of take advantage of perceived weaknesses from other cleaning companies in the market. Alan, do you ever get anybody that shows up and is like, I literally don't care. I'm not that excited about anything. I just want to find something that makes money. <laughs> Most people care about something. And you can, with a bit of probing, find out what excites them. You ask a set of questions like, so what would you do in your spare time if you had nothing on? Or what did you do when you were younger and no one was looking? Or if you had a weekend with your friends, what would you plan? And there's some questions to start to help you understand some of the ideas. If people genuinely don't care, and I've not found one of those yet, that there's something they like if you probe hard enough. If they genuinely don't care, then they just need to start something. And they could even start a blog about finding your passion and talk about their journey and lack of having one. And I'll tell you what, if they did that with passion, they'd probably get somewhere. Okay, fair enough. So let's say you kind of go through these questions, you come up with some potential ideas. Are there certain business models that you guide people toward or that you like for people just starting out? In terms of specific business models, not really, because you never know whether someone's starting a product business, a service business, an online business. There's so many different ways to do it. I think our foundational principle is get the idea out there as quickly as possible and test it. And we have a saying, which is fail fast and fail cheap. The traditional way of starting a business is the exact opposite. You write a 30-page business plan, you set up a company structure, and then you borrow a load of money and go heavily into debt. And the last thing you do in that process is to start to sell, the very last thing. And if it goes wrong at that point, that's failing slowly and failing expensively. What we suggest to people to do is exact opposite. I mean, what's the only way to know if your business idea will be successful or not? If somebody's going to pay you for it. If someone's going to pay you for it. And most people avoid asking that question. They'll go and see friends and say, what do you think about the idea? And the friends go, yeah, it's great. It's great. You should do it. Is that good feedback? It doesn't really help. Yeah, probably not, unless you're asking them for a check. That's exactly what you should do, is at that moment where they say it's great, you should do it, you should lean in and go, it's 20 bucks, I've got a sample in the car, would you like to buy one? And it's only at that point you will get the real answer. People will be nice to you up until you ask them to get your wallet out of their pocket or their purse out of their bag. Once you ask for money, you'll get the real decision, you'll get the real answer. Up until that point, they're just being nice. Yeah. Now for a service business or a product business, that is easier to get to a no or a yes right away. But how about for an online business like the mattress review blog or the ski tour blog or something like that, where it's like, it might take some time to fail fast. It might take some time to build up a critical mass of readership there. Absolutely. You're right. And it does. And those online business models you do see the superstars create a podcast in six to nine months to get a good listenership. But for the average person, it takes longer. I think even if you're building that online model, there is still a way to ask for immediate feedback. So one of the failures I had in my business very early on was my website had no call to actions. There was nothing anyone could actually do on my website. There was just content and that was it. 
And even if it's just collecting email addresses, even if it's like, if you think I'm on the right track with this blog or this podcast or this online skiing guide, then click like so that I know I'm on the right way or leave a comment. I'm just getting into this. But if you ask for interaction and ask for engagement, if you don't get any of it, well, we've got some concerns. If you start to get some, you've got at least some signals. You've got at least some kind of reaction from people. So yeah, if you enjoyed this, sign up to my mailing list now. That just at least tells me that I should keep writing these articles for you. And I think it probably goes without saying is if you are starting that online type of business, you still have to go and tell people about it versus just putting it out on the internet and hoping and praying somebody's going to find it. Google may eventually find it if your content is strong enough, but it's almost, you're going to have to give it that initial push. And we found the same thing to be true, even on pre-existing marketplaces like Amazon and Udemy and iTunes, where it's like, if you can provide that initial marketing push, the algorithms start to work in your favor. And then, because until you do that, no one's, no one's even going to see your call to action on your website. They're not even going to see the little button that says, you know, sign up here for updates or, or join my mailing list. Absolutely. And there's a saying in society and culture, if you build it, they will come. And I think that's thanks to Field of Dreams and Wayne's World. And it's the biggest lie out there. If you build it, no one will come until you promote it, until you share it, until you get it out there and tell people about it. So if you build it, no one will come until you promote it. What have you seen from your students as far as creative ways to go pre-sell an idea since you're advocating hey don't buy business cards like don't build a website don't go into debt what have you seen as an effective way to go to market quickly and basically validate like does this have legs is this going to be a good idea or not we are blessed today with the advances in technology how quickly and easy it is to build a website to put something online to get it designed i guess a real life example was a lady at one of my previous courses came to me. She was doing a healthcare product and she came to me and said, how many bottles should I buy? Like, I'm just about to order the packaging and all of the stuff. Should I buy 5,000? Should I buy 10,000? And she was looking for a straightforward number answer of what she would buy. But I tell you what, what we found is there are so many entrepreneurs out there who have bought the stuff and they've got it in their garage and they don't sell it. And my advice to her was, well, let's try and pre-sell it. And she said, well, I can't pre-sell it because I don't have a picture of it. I need to order some to get a picture. Well, well, just hire a graphics designer, you know, on people per hour or on fiverr.com or anywhere and get them to knock up a version that people can see, write a page and start to promote it and get it out there. And then you'll get a very quick feeling of whether people actually want it. So use Weebly.com or build a free website, put up a one pager, promote it everywhere and see if people engage and buy. This is not a new idea. It has been around forever, but for some reason it's not widely known. I mean, way back when I was younger, early 90s, there's a business called Cotton Traders that sold Cotton polo shirts, cotton t-shirts, cotton rugby jerseys, stuff like that. And they used to have the thing in the back of the newspaper. The very back of the newspaper, there was like that cut out bit that said, here's the picture, we're producing these, tick your size, post it into us with a check. I don't know if your audience are old enough to remember checks, but you post it I'm, in with I'm a check. I'm sure some of us, I'm still writing checks. Yeah. <laughs> are you? Very infrequently, but it happens. Yeah. I guess you do a lot more checks in America then. But yeah, they said post it in with a check. And then in the very fine print, it says delivery is six to eight weeks. Why is delivery six to eight weeks? And it's because the polo shirts didn't exist. And what they would do is wait for all the checks to come in. They would go and cash the checks to make sure they had the money and then place the order with the factory to produce exactly that number of T-shirts and shirts. And the model has been around for a long time. It's just, it's not really your entrepreneur's first thought is go pre-sell it. 
And it doesn't really matter how you do it, whether it's a website, whether it's a Kickstarter page, whether it is just going onto the street and saying, here's my idea, here's my sample, would you like to order one? It doesn't really matter how you do it. Just go and check the idea, get it out there as quick as possible and see if people will buy. And I tell you what, you'll learn more from one good customer interaction than you will from weeks of Google research. Yeah. Have you got people kind of going down that path? So one of the popular side hustles of the last several years is the Amazon FBA business fulfillment by Amazon. I'm going to order this bulk shipment of products from China and I'm going to send those into Amazon and Amazon's going to ship those out to my customers as they sell. But you could be looking at a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars minimum order there. So it sounds similar to your beauty product woman, where it's like, until I get it out onto the marketplace, I don't have anything to sell. So you would advocate (laughs) getting one or two samples and like standing on the street corner and getting pre-orders. It seems like if you're coming up with a yoga mat, get a sample, design it, go down the yoga studios and speak to the customers. Don't ask them their opinion, ask them to buy. If they say no, then ask their opinion. If they say yes, then tell them it's coming soon and you'll get it to them and take the money there and then. Yeah, get a sample, get a picture, get something, pitch your idea. And I tell you what, even if you don't have a sample, just going out and pitching your idea and talking to a real life customer and saying, here's what I want to do. Here's what it'll look like. Here's what it'll do. Do you have this problem that I'm trying to fix? Does it help you? Just the act of pitching your idea will help clarify whether people actually want it. Um, sell the value before you build the product. And I think that's one of the most important bits is sell what it is. Because if you can't sell it from an idea or at least get people interested enough to give you a deposit, you're going to struggle when you get the actual thing. Yeah, that reminds me of Abby Ashley, a recent guest on the podcast. Her initial pre-sales page for her virtual assistant course she said was a Google Docs sheet. You know, she just she just shared the link to this Google Docs page. It was like, hey, this is totally free, no website needed. And I forget, I mean, she sold thousands of dollars worth of this thing before she had created it. I was inspired by that one. So on the pitching front, so we've kind of talked through some service business ideas, some physical product ideas, some online business ideas. And you kind of alluded to this a moment ago with, okay, What's the problem that the customer has that I'm going to solve? But I'm curious, what have you seen as some elements of successful pitches? So the elements of the successful pitch, I think, first off, we always run this exercise. I probably shouldn't give this exercise away, but I'm going to anyway. So if you're coming on the course, forget you ever heard this. I put up a big picture of a Mont Blanc pen on the screen. And I pull out my Mont Blanc pen that my brother gave me for my 30th. Thank you, Roy, if you're listening. And I describe the pen. It's got an enamel inlay barrel. It's got a platinum nib. It's a fountain pen. It's got the Mont Blanc crystal at the top. It's a stunning pen. It's about $600 worth of pen. And then someone from the audience, right, sell me the pen. And what happens every time is people sell me the pen They go, it's enamel inlay barrel. It's got a platinum nib. It's got the Mont Blanc crystal. They sell me what they've got. What every person who's pitching forgets to do is to understand the client first. So are you even looking for a pen? Do you use a pen? Do you give expensive gifts? Like there's so many questions you can ask before you pitch to understand. And I think People go straight into the pitch when they're new at this because they're so excited about what they do. And it's exactly what I did. I was so excited about what I did, I would pitch it to everyone without understanding, even if they have the problem. So I think the first key to pitching is don't pitch, ask. Understand the person, understand their problems, understand their pain. And if they don't have the pain you're trying to fix... I don't even bother pitching. Move on to the next person or ask them who else you should speak to. After you've understood, it's far easier to shape the pitch to actually hit what that person is interested in. My tips then for the actual pitch is start with the bits that they're interested in and start in the heart of it, the very heart of it. No waffle, no messing about. 
here's the key bit right in the centre and get them interested with it and then build from there. If you kind of waffle, yes, we've been in business for this many years and, you know, we use all natural this and we've got offices here and here and I really like this stuff. People are bored after two minutes. You've got to get straight into the heart of the subject matter. So I think understanding them, what they really want, asking questions, then diving into the heart of it, the most important thing to them is going to get them hooked. Yeah, you're leading with the benefits, not the features, with the transformation, not the process. So it's like that spotless kitchen you've always dreamed of, so you can have more time with your family or whatever, instead of we use all natural cleaning products or something. <laughs> yeah, you, you probably heard those pitches a million times. Yeah, we're health and safety checked and we use all natural cleaning products. And well, who cares? What are you interested in? Do you enjoy cleaning your kitchen? How long per week do you spend cleaning your kitchen? What's your favorite task? What's your least? Go on. Yeah, there was one for, I want to say a landscaping service. And the headline was, get your Saturdays back, basically. You know, we'll mow the lawn for you. Get your Saturdays back. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's more powerful than a manicured lawn. You know, thinking of the, the benefit to, to the customer. Tell me about the pitch or the story for the first pop-up business school to the people who were footing the bill for it. What was that like? The first ever pop-up business school I sold was to a housing association in Western Supermare in England. I remember going down to see the guy. His name was Michael Williams from Alliance Homes. And I sat with him. I asked him lots of questions about his objectives for his residents and what he was doing and how things were changing. And one of the key bits of information that came was that the government in England was changing the way it handed out benefits. So in terms of housing benefits, it used to be that the housing benefit would be paid direct to the housing association, the housing authority, and the tenant would never see that money. They would just get to live in the home. But the government was about to change that and the money was going to go to the tenant. The tenant had to then budget correctly and save and then pay the rent to the housing authority. And what could go wrong there? What, what could go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> they could blow it before the end of the month. They could spend it on other stuff. And the housing associations were afraid that their residents wouldn't be able to pay their rent and their business model would fail. That was the pain they were trying to fix. And he told me this in the initial questioning. And he said, well, I think I can help with that. Here, we can help your residents start businesses. And he said, well, our residents, they're never going to write business plans they're probably going to be scared off by loans. That traditional service does not work for them. So then we started to come up with something new and a different way of doing it. And at the start, like I had the foundation of the idea, but we were co-creating it. And I'd have to say one of our favorite expressions at Pop-Up is people support what they co-create. So if you can go to a customer, find out their problem and co-create it with them, like you're halfway there. Then he asked me, would I send him some stuff and write him a proposal? So I had to go home, actually do some work now rather than just talking for my living. And I wrote him a proposal. Just as a side note, if your proposal only has one option, what are the only two possible answers? Yes or no. And that's it. And 90% of the time, you'll get a no. If your proposal has three options, you kind of have yes, no, maybe. You have yes, no, maybe. And you have actually, I really like this bit of number one and I like this bit of number three. And it's more likely to end up in a negotiation or a conversation rather than a flat no. So I'd recommend if you're ever writing a proposal for someone, put three options in there. Okay. Was that kind of a traditional small, medium and large package? I think that does actually work. We did exactly that. It was like, here's the basic version. Here's the middle version. Here's the really expensive version. And the really expensive version is meant to make the other ones look cheap. Sure, like a high-end price anchor. Exactly. And I was quite surprised when Michael Williams chose the most expensive package I gave him, which tells me one thing. I was far too cheap when I first started. <laughs> and he said yes to the expensive one, and I was in the game. I ran that one. That gave me the feedback and the kudos to be able to go out and pitch it to other people. But yeah, that first time... I asked questions and then we co-created the product and service 
I had the kernel of the idea, but he built the way it would look with me. Okay, so you kind of had this hypothesis. I think there's a market for this. I think this is the target customer. But based on this conversation, you know, the shape of it kind of changed a little bit and ended up making a deal. Absolutely. What's next for Pop-Up Business School? Anything exciting you got cooking? Yeah, we've got big plans. The overall plan for Pop-Up Business School is what we like to call the democratization of entrepreneurship, which is making the best entrepreneurial education available free and to anyone. And I guess you're on a similar mission with your incredible podcast, Helping People Get Going. We want to make it free for anyone. We've got some cool gigs coming up. We're going to be in Houston, in Texas in February. We've got a load of stuff going on in the UK. If any of your listeners are here, come along to one of our events. We'd love to help you get going. And that's the big plan, is to help anyone make an income doing something they love. And we don't care what background they're from. I like it. That's a fantastic mission. And I know you're making an impact over there. Popupbusinessschool.co.uk. If you want to check out what Alan is up to, highly recommend it. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Get in the game. Just start. I don't care what it is. Start a blog and figure it out. Start a podcast and figure it out and have a go. The idea is irrelevant because the idea you start with is probably not going to be the idea you're running in five years time. But if you don't start, you'll never start anything. So pick a ski blog, pick a random cleaning business, get a few clients, work out whether you like it or not and learn some lessons. The idea is irrelevant. Get in the game, Side Hustle Nation. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to tell people for years, man. <laughs> I love it. I think you'll see once you get started, you'll want to stay started. It, it really is addicting stuff. The call that the idea is irrelevant is so true. My friend Julie kind of frames it as your first move in a game of chess. You're going to move your pawn out into the world. What happens next kind of dictates the rest of the game, but it's just making that first move. So Alan, I love it. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Nick. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is brought to you by FreshBooks.com, the cloud accounting solution that's recommended by 97% of small business owners. I was chatting with Rob Eng, who's actually a senior marketing manager at FreshBooks, and he's a FreshBooks customer for his side hustle, which is a sandwich catering business. I thought that was super cool, but Rob shared this story about how every single employee spends their first month on the job answering the phones to learn firsthand about FreshBooks customers and the product. Whether you're, you know, the VP of marketing or you're just a developer, you have to do that full month. And we actually can't use it. You're actually a full-time sport rock star. So you have to really empathize to learn about our product, learn about the people that work at FreshBooks, and learn about our customer. It's a big investment we do to really show that even if you don't have a side business, we want you to understand and empathize with our customers. You, so when you do your actual job you're hired for, you have the customer in mind. Visit freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30-day completely free trial today. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle for bookkeeping bliss along with rockstar support. All right, my top three takeaways from this call with Alan. Number one is to start with what you know or start with what you care about. I was kind of trying to stump Alan a little bit or at least put his creative powers to the test, but I think he made a compelling case that starting with your knowledge and interests is a great way to come up with viable business ideas. Even in my examples that didn't have an immediate business that jumped out at me, he was able to turn those around and throw back a bunch of different ideas. So let that be your homework for this week. Seriously, make a list of your interests, hobbies, skills, especially if you're still kind of trying to find a side hustle to start, to see what potential business ideas come out of that. Remember, it doesn't have to be something completely new and innovative. Remember Noah Kagan's example. How many taco restaurants are in your town? It's always tacos with Noah. If they've been around for a year, they're probably profitable. If you're struggling with this, for extra credit, you can post that list in the comments for this episode at sidehustlenation.com slash Alan, and I'll ask him to stop by and give his two cents or pence, maybe, I think. <laughs> so that's takeaway number one. Start with what you know or what you care about. Takeaway number two is to start for free or as close to free as you can. Even as somebody who has started probably half a dozen different businesses for less than 500 bucks, and that includes this podcast, I am impressed with Alan's creativity in finding ways to get off the ground for even less than that. I'm 100% on board with this bootstrap methodology for 
the simple reason of you don't know what's going to work. So it's scary to dump thousands of dollars into an unknown or worse to borrow thousands of dollars to dump into an unknown. I remember this one painful email. Well, it was painful to read. I don't know if the sender saw it as painful, but they explained they had paid this company $30,000 to develop their website and it was almost ready and then they could begin marketing. So let me be the bearer of good news. You don't need a $30,000 website. WordPress is free. Thousands of great looking themes are free. Hosting is like five bucks a month or less. And you can even get that for free if you're on a really, really tight budget. But most importantly, go find a customer first. You can always get official later. And that goes for logos and business cards too. They're good to have. I agree with that. But prove your concept first. Go find a customer first. Takeaway number three is the curse of the big business idea. This was kind of unspoken during the interview, but I think it's something worth addressing. So like I said, I've had lots of little business ideas over the year, and some of those have done very well. I have also had several bigger business ideas, but exactly zero of those have done very well. And why is that? Because in my mind, they were too big to achieve a liftoff. I didn't know the first step in getting them done and getting them off the ground. One example was back in college, a friend of mine, when you'd call him up, instead of hearing the usual phone ringing tone on your end, you'd hear his favorite song, which rotated like every month. He said it was called ringback tones. And I have no idea if those are still a thing, but it sparked this idea. If you could play music when somebody calls, you could play a targeted ad. You could get free cell phone service subsidized by sponsors, just like TV. It was going to revolutionize the industry. Only It didn't because it was too big for me to act on, and I didn't care enough about it to act on it either. So instead, I stayed in my lane, I painted houses, and eventually started selling shoes on the internet. So don't fall for the big business idea because for most of us, and obviously not all of us because there are these unicorns in the startup world that go on and build big businesses, there's a curse that they're too heavy to get off the ground. So that's what I call the curse of the big business idea. Start something small, start something free if you can, go find that first customer, and I think you'll be more likely to take action on that. Once again, notes and links for this episode are at sidehustlenation.com slash Alan, again, A-L-A-N. And while you're there, be sure to download the free PDF highlight reel summary with all of Alan's top tips from the call. If you like what you hear on the Side Hustle Show, be sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app. That way you never miss an episode. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 